Okay, <coughs> then we continue um, with urban structure. <coughs> this is uh, this is uh, what we see, as I have told you, in in many many American cities. Uh, completely motorized network. You have the motorways here, motorways here, and the dispersed, let's say, urban structure with small communities scattered around and you may have you may have a, a weak center in the, in, in the middle here so low density car based transport little road for public transport massive highway network and uh, and smaller centers which typically Grows where <coughs> secondary roads meets highways, like here, here. So that is <coughs> one one lesson that can be learned uh, as a general general rule, where you have intersections, stations. You are li likely to get some concentration of economic activity, and that is because the accessibility to such points are better. So, uh, <coughs> so that is uh, also something that we can take advantage of when we uh, in in denser economic system where we where we see a lot of development around uh, rail stations, for instance. So this is what we call type one in this uh, in this uh, way of categorizing urban systems. Type two <coughs> is uh, what we can call a weak urban center, where um, we have this problem that we can see here uh, locally in in the city of Olsund, where. Uh, the center is vulnerable to what happens in the suburbs. You may drain economic activity out of the center. So <coughs> the land use density is, is average. The central business district is, uh, is accessible by, by cars. Uh, because the density is low, traffic is relatively low. And uh, and it's uh, it's easy to get there. We don't have any uh, road pricing schemes in this type of uh, of uh, cities. We have a rather low density transit network, perhaps a limited number of transit lines, with not many intersections like this. You have a <coughs> highway system and, uh, and you have a dispersed structure of the, of the suburbs, which typically then locates, is located uh, around this, uh, this, this ring road. Yep, do you want to? Okay. Um, <coughs> so this is typically the structure in older cities where cars have taken over. And this is kind of this structure. This structure is smaller American cities. This is the, some of the bigger American cities where cars have taken over. San Francisco, San Diego, California, Dallas, Atlanta are cities of this type. San Francisco has managed to to sort of revitalize the urban center with public transport. And uh, Atlanta is struggling to do the same. Because they have, s they have seen, they have acknowledged that they have a problem with car use. Uh, it became evident when the when the fuel price went up 
quite sharply uh, five, six years ago. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> the commuting, uh, the way people commute mainly in this city towards the central business district. This, this panel shows a comparison of the built up area in Atlanta as compared to Barcelona in Spain. The same, uh, approximately the same number of people. The built up area in Atlanta is 4.3 thousand square kilometer, whereas in Barcelona it is 162. So the difference is, is substantial. Uh, <coughs> but they try their best to sort of reverse this ca high car dependency in, in Atlanta. We can have a short look at, at their system. This is the subway going like this. So the characteristics of this subway system is that it feeds only towards the city center. You can of course change here and go in, in this from here, change here and go in this direction. So <laughs> it's a kind of a hub and spoke network. The <coughs> the um, not so favorable thing with hub and spoke networks in public transit is that you might want to go from here to here directly. No possibility. You need to go via this this uh, this point. Uh, so it's uh, not very dense network, um, and because of the low density which we saw here, the people don't live close to uh, don't live close to these stations, and the. Um, Workplaces are not located closer to close to these uh, stations either. I'll show you a, a picture a bit later on. So it's it's little used because because of the long walking distances, a lot of barriers in terms of uh, of roads and things. People use their car instead. This is the brand new streetcar in Atlanta. It takes yeah, 15 minutes at normal speed to get around this, this loop. And uh, I took it on, uh, on last uh, Friday. And I might say that I must say that I wonder how the funding scheme looked like for this, uh, this system. Nobody used it. Me and a colleague was the only passengers. And it was quite obvious why, because the area from here to here was, um, let's say, it was, um, it was nothing going on there. The distance from here to here is give or take 200 meters. From here, you can walk straight over. So the walking distance from here and up to here is five minutes. Uh, so I mean, you can walk the most attractive parts of this loop within half an hour or so, perhaps a bit more. But I guess this is a kind of an, they have an incentive to build this. I guess that the federal Government has said that cities who um, establish streetcar lines will get funding from Washington DC, right? So they built this structure. And it links with, uh, with this uh, <coughs> MARTA is the, is the subway system. It links with MARTA at the Pearl Tree st Center here. Oh, there it is. A 
compare this with <coughs> Barcelona with 162 square meters. You have a lot of intersection points, so you can move quickly around almost all parts of town, the subway system. Dense population, not long walking distances, much easier to to uh, to um, to use the public transport network, and there are <coughs> in many cases in many of these intersection points, you get also a quite strong development of uh, workplace locations, dwellings, attractions for tourists, and so on. You have something similar like to this in Paris, even in New York. Manhattan, Brooklyn, and um, not so well in, in New York, not so dense, uh, and uh, other European cities as well. So the shape of the city, there is an interplay between the shape of the city and the design of the transport network. And it is a combination of history, path dependency, and public policy. The fuel prices in Spain, combined with a rather modest development in personal income, has contributed to a focus on density, public transport systems. In the US, and you have to remember that all these cities that I have shown you maps of have started from the same small center and the agricultural land around it, or fisheries or, or whatever. This is uh, close to the Mediterranean Sea. So, but they have de developed in different directions. So if a city starts to expand on a highway investment program combined with low fuel <coughs> prices, and a good growth in the economy, you get Atlanta or Dallas or San Francisco instead of this. This is just to show you how, how, s how strong the forces are and how difficult it is to reverse development patterns. The gray bars are the growth in the number of jobs between 1990 and 1998 in Atlanta. In places which is located, let's say, approximately one kilometer or more from bus lines or metro stations. So these are jobs, job locations that are, that are in essence car based. It's hard to get people, especially in the US perhaps, to walk one kilometer to and from work and to a subway, wait for the subway or the bus, and then go back home. Then they use their car instead, particularly if the road network is good. So <coughs> the growth in jobs close to the metro or bus lines in the same period, it's been 1%. So this results in a sharp increase in, in car use, and not much happens within the public transport network. It's an illustration of a kind of past dependency. Because when this happens, expansion of the of uh, highway network capacity will follow and it particularly if it f if it happens in a very di dispersed way so what can be done in a system like this it's not easy to say but one thing that could be done is to try to 
have a policy which directs the location of workplaces to corridors. Because if you have a corridor, you can, you can serve a corridor of places more easily with a, with a subway or a bus line. You can start with a bus line and then expand into a, into a subway as, as, uh, as the growth catches up. Without any idea or any direction in the urban planning, this will be spread out and it's very hard to, to, to reverse it. This is a type 3 system, which is uh, like Paris, Oslo, uh, parts of Berlin, where you have a strong city center, ring roads, you have also uh, subways or bus metro serving this. Uh, short commuter distances and a strong city center as opposed to as i mentioned olsen this system can stand a new suburb somewhere in the in the area without collapsing the center and the idea here is to <coughs> also have an interplay between the city center and the suburbs with commuting and the workplace is located uh, in the center and and then try to design a system which is uh, which is uh, fairly efficient with respect to, to energy use <coughs> as I said that uh, in the beginning one problem is that um, some of these cities are facing constraints with respect to land use in the center, so they need to expand. But as long as the center is fairly strong, it can be, it can be done, like Oslo, where the expansion is uh, southbound on each side of the Oslo Fjord and slightly northbound. It works because uh, there is a fairly decent transport network connecting the satellites or the, or the suburbs to the to the to the main city of Oslo. <coughs> this is a kind of a sketch of uh, of London, UK, and maybe also Stockholm in Sweden, where traffic limitation has been imposed and then we talk about road traffic car car use with a strong focus on uh, on public transport in in central areas a restriction of car use that can be done through physical limitations or in most cases road pricing um, perhaps also some reduction in uh, in uh, in road capacity which is uh, one tries to use road capacity reduction as a means for increasing the public transport share of the movements in some Norwegian cities as well. In this town, which we are in now, they have large, as I said earlier, they have large uh, invest. Uh, road expansion plans. In other medium-sized Norwegian cities, they try to reduce the road capacity leading into the, the core of the, of the city. So I'm a bit uncertain about the planners here, to be honest. <laughs> Um, <coughs> I think one reason is that uh, that um, the road network east eastwards will also carry some through traffic which is going southbound over the fjord so uh, so th they 
think that expansion is, is necessary to to serve that part of the traffic as well, which is not going into the city center, but further on to north or southbound from, from Alder. In London, they have uh, implemented a quite aggressive road pricing scheme with different zones where they charge for the use of the road network. In Stockholm, they have also done that. They started the road pricing scheme there as a trial project and they had a referendum. People voted yes or no to a continuation of the road pricing scheme. And surprisingly enough, and surprisingly to surprise, uh, that also came as a surprise to the city government. The majority was in favor of a road pricing scheme. The reason for that was that the accessibility became much better. Not that much congestion in the road network. And they had also, at the same time as they implemented the road pricing scheme, they have increased the departure frequency of the public transport network. So it was a possibility for people to transfer to, to bus or, uh, or uh, subway. It was a mix of, uh, of means that were taken to, to um, let's say, improve the tra transport flow in, in Stockholm. And road pricing is not there to collect money to the government, but it's there to regulate traffic and to make the car users pay the socioeconomic costs of using the transport network. That is the main difference. I talked a bit about that on an earlier lecture. And you need also to have in mind that you might need to also do some kind of congestion pricing in the public transport network at the same time to avoid uh, too much congestion there as well. So uh, this is another, let's say, categorization of city types. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a kind of a name on, let's say, policies that can be used. You have the business as usual, which is uh, the American way, where you just uh, continue as you used to with the, let's say, car-based dispersed city development. You have the compact city <coughs> with increased population in the in the suburbs. Seems to be nice because you get a very condensed structure. The problem might be that you run out of, uh, of land and it might be that even in compact cities people <coughs> need to go somewhere else, let's say to get to go to work or maybe to, to do their shopping or to do whatever activity. And if, <coughs> if the activities outside or the functions outside of the compact city is dispersed, then you may need, you may need, or you may get a lot of transportation movements going on anyway. So the shorthand structure here is that people are <laughs> kind of commuting perhaps in an efficient way rather efficient way, but uh, after work they need to go, they need to do a lot of transportation to sort of serve their needs. Come back to this a bit. The edge city <coughs> we, where we, um, we have this uh, suburbs outside of the core. And then you have the corridor cities. <coughs> 
And I call it a string of pearls because you have the core, you have the core like this, CBD, and then you may have cities like this connected with transport systems. And it goes without saying that it is much easier to, to serve this system with a public transport network. And if the system becomes sufficiently large, you can even start to link them like this. So people can go between. I'll show you a picture of Copenhagen afterwards. The fringe city, where growth, growth pr predominantly happens at the outskirts. <coughs> if you go back to, to this guy and think about the regulation of the building structure in the, in the central business district, you run on into constraints, and then the growth takes place at the outskirts. And uh <coughs> A fringe city can be like this at best. At worst, it is a business as usual structure where things just uh, get dispersed and very car based. And you have this ultra city, <coughs> which is kind of the structure in, in, uh, in Oslo, in the Oslo Fjord area where some of the cities are, are um, s up to 1,100 uh, kilometers from the central business district, and you link with, with high-speed rail, which could also, in essence, be a string of pearls like this. And this is, I mean, in some, in some areas, this is kind of implemented. I'll show you a couple of maps in a, in a short while. A third way of categorizing urban forms is can be seen here, where you have the monocentric model, which is the, the let's say, the big European cities, New York, you have the polycentric <coughs> model, <coughs> which is uh, some of the American urban areas. You have this, as uh, can be uh, a bigger American city, it can describe Atlanta, which looks something like this. And you have this nice urban village model, which you don't find anywhere, where people are working and living in smaller centers, and they have some interactions in between. But where they are relatively equal in size and shape and so on, you don't find that structure in any places. And it is interesting to know why you don't find that structure in any places. So when we have been through the theory of new economic geography, which will take after Easter, you will have a better understanding of why this structure is not, it's not common. It n it's actually non-existent. And there, but I can say that the reason is that as soon as one of these places starts to grow bigger than the others, you get the kind of centrifugal force concentration because they become a little stronger, a little or a slightly better labor market, slightly larger number of jobs, slightly larger number of restaurants and so on. And then people tend in a, in a landscape like this with, let's say, 
short distances and so on to migrate towards the biggest the biggest concentration and that concentration then becomes bigger and the other ones maybe they remain at the same level so the drive towards a quasi monocentric or a monocentric structure is kind of driven by kind of market forces and we will talk more about that <coughs> this is Oslo the Oslo Fjord area these lines are rail lines up to here it's 120 kilometer down here it's about the same 120 connected with rail li lines And, as I said, in this central uh, town of Oslo, you have area restrictions because of uh, the landscape and the fjord. So there is a very strong focus now on developing the pearls close to Oslo by improving the rail system to get something like this. You will never get this cross crossbound here, but this pearl can be this pearl pattern can be seen rather easily. This is a plan from nineteen forty eight Copenhagen. This is the plan the central business district and the pearls as I drew there, drew there this is how it looks like today and it's quite imp impressive to see the match between the theory the nice theory, the plan and how it has developed corridors rather strong, good public transport networks you have some uh, some links uh, across and you have green areas in between the fingers for recreational purposes and so on so when you are in Copenhagen you don't see this of course it's uh, you need a bird's view to to actually see it but it's uh, it works this way And it's possible to expand them, <coughs> of course, to, to, to increase the size of these areas, but also to expand further out and still be able to connect to the city center. So it's, uh, it's kind of nice to see that some uh, <coughs> theoretical constructs can work in practice. They, it's not always the case, but this, uh, this is kind of exciting, I think. Then you can also, <coughs> without much efforts, restrict car use in the central area if you need to do that, and still maintained, maintain a very good accessibility through public transport, because you have the necessary density in place. So here we can see a slide showing the relationship between urban structure and dominant modes of transport. This again, uh, the condensed cities here, where you see the density in built up areas, people per hectare increases. And the polycentricity is increasing up here. And a, a shorthand or an alternative term for polycentricity is dispersed urban structures in many centers. And uh, car, cars um, doing most of the transport work. So this is uh <coughs> Johannesburg which I have talked about, 
clearly in this upper left hand uh, side. Atlanta is here, it's the worst performer in the, in the group. And then on to Shanghai, Hong Kong, some of the den very dense cities. Not all of them uh, in, uh, in a very good shape, one might say, because the concentration is uh, partly due to, to low income levels and, uh, and, and problems. Like, for instance, in, in Bombay, in India, even if it is, it's growing quite strongly, also in terms of uh, economic prosperity. But the reason for the concentration has to do with, uh, with poverty, for, uh, to, to a large extent. Whereas Hong Kong <coughs> is more, much more prosperous. And uh, and also, uh, it has grown because of a very special political, um, let's say, a very pol a special political uh, environment. It used to be a British colony, right? So it was very attractive to to locate there to do business with China. Nowadays, it's a part of China, but it is they are allowed to, let's say, go on like they used to under the British uh, uh, jurisdiction. So uh, let's say more personal freedom and things like that. So it has grown very strongly. I was there in 1999, I think, 1998, mm -hmm. the same year as they handed over the jurisdiction to the, the British handed over the jurisdiction to the Chinese. And uh, I have looked at, m at pictures from recent years, and I can hardly recognize Hong Kong, the skyline, now as compared to 1998. Skyscrapers all over the place. And then you have <coughs> the mix in between here, where you find quite a lot of the European cities and some, quite, quite some other cities as well. We have the mix of modes. Quite annoying with this uh, chainsaw. All right, um, I think we, uh, we break again. <coughs>